Hey, Mr. Berman, since um, it was rumored, I think you reported it, that the front office at the trade deadline or before the All-Star break wasn't particularly happy with Mr. Thibodeau and, in fact, maybe wanted to fire him. But it appears that Leon is still sticking with him. So do you think if next season starts off poorly that Tom would be on the hot seat? No question. No question about it. Mm. I reported that at least two members of the front office recommended to Leon uh, that, that he has lost the team and it might be wise to let Thibodeau go. Leon wanted nothing of it. He completely still believes in Thibodeau because, listen, this was his big hire. You know, he when he became the Knicks president, he talked about his relationships, gonna, it was going to help him draw free agents, what have you. Well, so far, all his relationships have brought is Tom Thibodeau. Thibodeau came to the Knicks because of Leon Rose. Leon was his agent in a past lifetime. Uh, he believes in Leon. He trusts Leon. That's why he chose it. He could have waited for the other teams to come out of the bubble. And there were a lot of vacancies. And I think he may have gotten an offer. He could have gotten an offer elsewhere. But he chose the Knicks uh, before any of the other offers uh, openings occurred. So the fact that Leon was going to stick with his guy is not a shock, but I will say if things get off to a rotten start next season, you could definitely start the countdown on the Thibodeau watch. Mm -hmm. Is Johnny Bryan, who's, whose title is associate head coach, would he be considered the successor if that happened? I mean, if w William Wesley calls the shots, certainly so. He, mm. uh, was behind Johnny Bryant's hiring. Uh, he wanted Woodson also, as well as Kenny Payne. William uh, thought that, that Thibodeau's, Thibodeau needed a more diverse staff. Uh, he didn't want to just have him hire his old guys from Chicago and Minnesota. So he brought in Johnny Bryant, and we've made the connection about Johnny's close relationship with Donovan Mitchell uh, back in Utah. I saw them talking after the game in Utah uh, in March or whenever it was uh, when we were out there. So, I mean, if Johnny Bryan is head coach, <laughs> who knows? Maybe yeah. Donovan Mitchell actually decides, hey, he loves New York anyway. He spends his off seasons in New York. Uh, he wanted to get drafted by the Knicks. So if Johnny Bryan is head coach, you know, maybe Donovan finally does ask for a trade. But, yeah, there's no doubt that, that I don't think that Tom Thibodeau, if Johnny Bryan moved on, like Kenny Payne and Mike Woodson, I don't think Thibodeau would blink an eye. In fact, we, someone asked Thibodeau about Johnny Bryan as an assistant coach, and he kind of mentioned he's a very good young coach, and then he started talking about the other guys on the staff. Oh, oh. So, <laughs> man. He's, literally, his title is associate head coach. That's Johnny's title, associate head coach. Right. So, um, listen, Johnny has great relationships with the players, and he actually was very close with Kemba Walker and tried to get him through a very tough time, mm. although it did not work out in the end. That's that's very interesting, uh, especially I, I feel like I heard you say before that he doesn't even use his um, assistant coaches as offensive offensive uh, as for offensive advice during the games. So um, this leads me to this next question, right? So the front office seems like they have a lot of input. They seem like they had input in Jericho Sims getting playing time. Um, so do you think the front office will push Tom to prioritize playing guys like Cam Reddish next season, who we have invested interest in, right? Because we, we traded a, a first round pick for him in Kevin Knox. And do you also feel like they will have Tom actually be more open to involving an offensive coordinator and all? Wow, I mean, Tom is very stubborn. Uh, it would be, it would be very tough for Tom. Uh, his ego would be hurt if, if there was a demand. You have to hire an offensive coordinator. I think they should hire a shooting coach. Their free throw shooting this season was terrible, and they did decline from the three point uh, line. But in terms of an offensive coordinator, I would say that that's unlikely, and definitely they wouldn't term it that way. They do have an opening now. But, you know, to your point before about assistant coaches, during a game, Tom doesn't consult with those guys. He knows what he wants to do. He knows the game plan better than anyone. 
he's st- the one great thing about Tom when the advanced scouts hand in their uh, documentation on the upcoming team, he reads every word of it. So he doesn't mm-hmm. have to consult with anyone. And basically his assistants are there for practice and to motivate the guys in the locker room, right. but not for in game strategy, but offensive coordinator, I would be very surprised if that's the way they go. I mean, they may hire an assistant coach that has some offensive uh, background, a, a more offensive background than defensive background, but they would def- definitely never brand it as an offensive coordinator. I, I can see. They make it, I guess they would just have them utilize him more and not really announce it to the public. That might be the best way to do it without bruising his ego. Yeah, but still with strategy, I mean, Tom is, he's the guy. I, he, he never, every other coach, it seems, he's talking to his assistants and getting their input. Tom just go. They call a timeout. Tom goes right to the huddle, uh, bends down, you know, with, with the guys and starts to steal. He know, and Tom was very vocal after the season when he was talking about. He was taking a shot at me in the media. He was saying, "Listen, unlike you guys, I watched the games three times." Oh, we saw that. <laughs> we had a discussion yeah, yeah. about that. He was very adamant. <laughs> there is nothing that is going to escape me. I am working my butt off. So all this criticism on social media, I don't pay attention to because I know they're not watching the game three times. And, uh, you know, and then he wouldn't even evaluate the season as a whole. He said he needed a week to two weeks to go over every game and analyze what went wrong. He said, I got to dig deep to figure this out. <laughs> he needs to follow the Knicks film school guys and realize that mm-hmm. they we do watch film three right, times. I, I think, <laughs> we do watch film. I think, I, think, I, think, I, think there's, I think there's a bit of a disconnect because he's taking it as if we believe he's not working hard. We believe he's working hard. Absolutely. He's just not working smart. And that's that's the problem we have. He's not he's not actually strategizing in the year 2022. He's going back to 2010. And and it's, it's not that he's not working hard. It's just that he's not really adjusting to today's NBA. Facts. Well, Roy, you're right. I mean, I, I think that his reputation as the hardest working coach in the NBA still stands, Facts. but he's very stubborn and he believes that Alec Burks from a defensive standpoint, he likes the tall point guard defensively and he feels it's pos- positionless basketball and he was going to ride that to the end and he did. He wrote it to the very, very end to the last game which I was, I mean, listen, quickly started that last game with Burks in the backcourt because of RJ's injury. But if RJ didn't get hurt, uh, it would have been Burks and RJ and Fournier in that final uh, game on Sunday. 